Uh, okay, so now, in the case of folded cascode, let's, let's see what it does. First of all, let's look at the gain. Is the gain the same? Kind of, right? So let, let's see. Let's look at different parameters. How do we determine the gain? So let's say we have a differential input. So let's say we have a DID and minus DID of the input over 2. DID over, minus DID over 2 plus DID over 2. And now that corresponds to currents being basically generally going in, which is GMBID over 2 and minus GMBID over 2, which can basically be uh, shown as, well, let's do it this way. This goes that way and this one goes this way. So this is GM VID over 2. Now, this kind of being pulled out of here is pulled out of here. So this is GM VID over 2. But this current is constant, supposedly, right? This is like a current source. There's no signal on this one. And that is reflected here. So this gives me GM VID over 2. And this one, the same way. This one is the constant part. This one, most of the current goes through here. This is the low impedance path anyway. And if you're concerned about this guy, think about it this way. It's a current divider, right? The current injected into this one is divided between two things. What are the two things? What are two impedances? Looking down, what do you see? R-O. R-O, right? R-O of this guy. Looking up, what do you see? R-M, for more of GM. So, of course, most of the current goes through here. For all practical purposes, all of the current goes through here. So that's why I'm not concerned too much about this side. For now. So in terms of the transconductance, and this is also, so this is GM VID over 2. Okay, fine. Now, so in terms of the, drop, the current driving the output impedance, the output known is the same, GM VID. So what about is the total output impedance? What is the impedance on that output? Well, let's look at what is the impedance looking up? That hasn't changed. That's basically whatever we call. GM5, RO5, RO7. By assuming that this is, well, let's make it. So this is, let's call them 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, and 10. Okay? So looking up is the same. Now, what is the impedance looking down? GM. GM what? R O times. GM three yeah. times R O three. R O three times GM one. GM one. Why GM one? If you know the inputs from a single oh. perspective, right? right? This what you see looking into here. She's looking here is R O one. So, it's so looking this way, you see R O one. Looking down, what do you see? R O nine. So looking into here, what do you see? The parallel combination. So it's this times. Well, it's G M three R M R O three times the parallel combination of R O one and R O nine. Right, so I've lost some gain there because of this. But let's see how much it is. Let's, let's get it. So my total gain, if I were to write it down, in this case, um, AB would be GM1 um, RO well, times GM5 RO5 RO7 in parallel with um, GM3 RO3 R01 in parallel R09. Okay, so that's just assuming the same current levels as before and the same with the else. This gives me what? In one millisiemens times. Okay, this part hasn't changed, which is the second part, which is the 5 megahold. In parallel with this part, what was this number? It was GM3, which was GM1, uh, 1 millisiemens times. Uh, 200 kilo ohms, that was 200. So that's 200 times the parallel combination of these two, which is the output of this guy and the output of that guy. It's the P fed. Oh, actually, there's one caveat. Um, this is 
is not GM, G, it's GM1, but it's not going to anymore. Why? Why not? Why is it not going to anymore? It's PMOS. PMOS, right? It's the GM of these guys. This is my differential drive. Right, exactly. So it's basically half of those units. If I use a 50 over 1, I don't have to. So the 5 mega ohms there, and this one becomes GM3, which is an NMOS, it's 1 millisiemens times that, so that's 200 times the parallel combination of these, this output resistance and that output resistance. Assuming that the W over L is the same, what did I have? I have 200 kilo ohms and 100 kilo ohms. So it's 67 kilo ohms. 67 kilo ohms times 100, 6.7 mega ohms. Okay? So now, that 40 mega down went down to 67 mega 6.7 mega So let's see what the parent condition of that is. It's 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, it's 1430. Let's say 1400. And of course, you can get the multiplied by 1 plus chi, so it's about 1500. So it's 1500. Approximately. So we lost some gain, but we gained some head.
kind of stage do I use? Well, it's a single ended stage and I need a relatively high gain, so maybe I can go to a uh, common source with some active load. So I go to the next stage, which can be... Now, what kind of stage do I use? Do I use an end fed or key fed here? So let me, give you, let me show you two alternatives. One looks like this. And the other alternative, so there's an alternative, you do one or the other, right? So B, D, D. I just go graph. Oh, minus B, D, D, S, S. And this would be the output here. So which one would you do? And fat version or the key fat? Well, what determines, before you answer my question, tell me what determines your decision, what affects your decision. How would you make that decision? The DC levels. DC levels, right? Yeah. So, what is the DC level here when the stage is balanced? We had a similar problem with the bipolar, right? So, the DC level here is approximately a VGS plus delta V, a VT plus delta VGS, right? Or a VGS. Because these two will have pretty much similar voltages. Everything's balanced and nice. And therefore, this would be about, so what is this voltage? This voltage is minus VSS, minus VSS, plus a VT plus a delta VGS. So it's a VT plus delta VGS above minus VSS, which is this voltage, right? Now, if I were to, and now from this side, what voltage do I have? For this guy, I would have this voltage would be a VDD minus a VT minus a delta VGS. So if I just hook it up between these two, I have quite a bit of conflict. Think about it. Because let's say I'm running at 5 volts or 3 volts, doesn't matter. Let's say plus minus 5 volts. 5 minus 0.5 minus 0.2 is, this is 4.3 volts, plus 4.3. This would be minus 4.3. So it's going to be very happy, and even if I adjust the W overall else to make that happy for 5 volts, it's going to be very happy for 3 volts, or for 6 volts. So the best way is to get both of these reference to one side, either the negative side or the positive side, and that this is the way to do it, because if you do it like this, then this would be exactly VGS plus uh, VGS, which is a VT plus delta VGS, over this guy. So I can use that to get the appropriate bias. So I need something like this. Now, if I, were to, if I wanted to use a PFET as my second state, I should have inverted this one and made this an NMOS input drive. And that would have worked out. So, this is the, the thing, and then I need, of course, a current source here, which I can do using a PMOS. And this one also needs to be a PFET. So, let's just have this, and then I need a reference branch here. gives you an IRF. We know how to do Now, the way it is, um, why didn't I put a buffer between this stage and that stage? Do you remember when we were doing the bipolar amplitude but offhand? We had to spend quite a lot of time getting this buffer stages between the gain, gain stages, right? The problem there was that the impedance of this node is, was high, which still is, but this is a quite a high impedance node. Now, and as soon as I put some sort of load on it, I have to worry about the, the lowering of that impedance and lowering my gain. Why don't I worry about it here? Simple answer, of course. Yeah, that's the risk. Right, exactly. The input impedance of this thing, the low frequency input impedance of this thing, is infinite. Right? So I don't have to worry about that problem. That's great. Because then I can get a whole bunch of intermediate stages. Right? And I don't have to, do you remember I have to go up a couple of times and down a couple of times to make sure that I get the right number of VPEs and all those things? I just do it once. I go up and down. So that's okay. So this is my output. And of course, this output is only capable of driving a capacitive load because it's a high impedance load. If I were to drive some sort of resistive load, then I have to have some sort of a buffer stage, driver stage at the output. But now let's assume that. For now, we are talking about driving capacitive nodes. As you can see, this is an example of a capacitive node. 
right? The first stage is driving the capacitor to two. Here. So, what is the gain of this thing? Let's cap it. It's relatively straightforward, right? So, what is the gain from the in differential input to this node? So, my AV, so let's call this V1. AV, the total AV is V1 over VID times VO over V1, right? The gain from here to there times the gain from here to there. So, what is the gain V1 over VID? The gain of the first stage. Tell me what it is, but help me out. It's GM1 GM times RO1 in parallel with RO3, which is RO in parallel with ROP. Right? And what is the gain on the second stage from here to there? It's again GM, let's name it, it's M5, M6, M7. So it's GM5 times RO5 in parallel with RO6. So I get a GMR squared kind of thing again. Right? Which I could get from my telescopic cascode. But now, let me answer this question. What is the voltage swing range for this guy? At the output. How high and how low can it go? Correct. So it can go quite high. Actually, it, can, it only needs to maintain a delta BGS, which is really the minimum you can expect, unless you do something really fancy. Uh, Right? Drop here. And the same thing here. Right? So this can go with delta VGS. It can get as close as the delta VGS to VSS, minus VSS. Right? So this one has a reasonably good output swing. So that's one of the other advantages of the two stage RPAC. And of course, it has tremendous potential for additional gain if I need that. Right? How would you, because now I have a lot of stuff I can mess with. So just give me some suggestions. I won't do them, but just, just give me some ideas. By now I should be able to. So what can I do if I want to get more gain out of this guy? Use a cascode that's pointed out. So you're pointing to the cascode. So I can make this a cascode state. I can make this a cas cascode state. I can make this a better current source. Uh, and I can get all sorts of things going on for me to increase the gain, right? In principle, if I make this a cascode and make this a cascode, a double cascode, double cascode, what kind of a gain do I expect? Order of magnitude. GMRO to the fourth, right? And you can see that that, may be, that can be respected, right? Because GMRO squared is on the order of thousand, a couple of thousands. That can be on the couple of orders. Generate an error signal and then feed it back through this one. 
I'm sure all of you have seen this in brain, right? So what is the transfer function for this? If you don't remember it, what you can do? Second? AF over 1 plus AF. 1 AF over 1 plus AF. So basically V out over VN, as you pointed out, is AF, A over 1 plus AF, right? Now, how do I obtain that? If I read out, let's get rid of the error signal. VE is VN minus V out times F. Right? And that gets multiplied, so but V out is A times v, VE. Okay? And that basically gives me A V in minus A F V out. And I move this one to this side, I get basically that equation. That function. Right? Now, what's the point? The point is that we have to pay attention to what happens when A becomes very large. When A gets very large here, what happens to this V out versus V in relation? One over the rest. Yeah, exactly. So when A goes to infinity, it becomes one over F. In other words, it becomes independent of A. That's why I tried so hard through the semi-Kaluji approaches to get my gain as high as possible. Right? You can see that gain depends on a lot of things. And if you, as some of you pointed out before, it even depends on which region of operation I'm in, slightly change the operation when you breathe on it, it changes. But as long as it remains high, I don't care. But eventually, it's this feedback ratio that determines how it works. And we'll see some examples of that today, and we'll see a lot more examples next quarter. But then, um, ha what happens to the error signal in that case? So, what is this error signal when um, that happens, right? Let's calculate the error, the error signal in terms of Vn. So, it's Vn, uh, or V out doesn't matter, right? So, it's Vn uh, minus AF times uh, 1 plus AF Vn, right? Which basically becomes Vn times 1 over 1 plus AF. Now, if A goes to infinity, what happens to the error signal? Exactly. Now, and that's the basis for what we call the virtual short or virtual ground principle in RPAP. So let's see it in an RPAP. So, an ideal RPAP, or a good approximation of an ideal RPAP, looks like this. So you can think of it, it has two terminals, right? And what you see at the output, so let's say this is Vn, with the two polarities, and what you see at the output, ideally, is A, Vn, some large gain times Vn, right? So now, let's say I apply some sort of feedback. So this is probably the most common form of feedback you're familiar with. So let's say you make this, you connect this to some potential, let's say ground for now, and this is connected to the end. Let's say this is R1 and this is R2, right? Let's calculate this, uh, well, this, let's call this VE, and this would be AVE, right? So what is the current through here? What is this current? How do you know? <laughs> well, uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, not yet. No, yes, yeah, so, yeah. so it is in general, it's Vn minus Ve divided by R1. Right? This voltage minus that voltage divided by R1. Now, what is the current going into the op-amp? Nothing. If it's an ideal op-amp, if it's a good op-amp, the input current is zero or very small. So that current would be the same as this current. So this is I1. That's I1. Right? And therefore, this voltage V out can also determine what the I1 is. So basically, VE, which is this voltage, minus V out, which is that voltage, divided by R2, should give me the same result. Right? Now, okay, so let's calculate V out in terms of Vn. Therefore, if I move uh, this term over I mean, to the other, so let's multiply both sides by R2. And, well, let's write it as V out is VE um, 1 minus R2 over R1. And, uh, okay, let's do actually something else before I do that. Sorry. So, let's write V out in terms of VE. So, it's basically A, VE with a minus sign. So, it's 1 plus A. Right? 
Now, then I guess write VE in terms of VN. VE is what? I move this one to the other side again. VE times 1 plus A plus R2 over R1 um, is what? R2 over R1 VN. Did it right? No, okay, but I think I messed it up. Let me just rewrite this. So, Vn minus Ve over R1 is I1, which is equal to Ve minus V out over R2. Now, V out is A minus Ave, so it's Ve times 1 plus A um, over R2. Therefore, Vn uh, is Ve plus R1 over R2, 1 plus A, Ve. Okay? Do I have it right? Therefore, Ve is Vn over 1 plus R1 over R2, 1 plus A. And if A goes to infinity, or if it's very large, what is that VE? So that tells you that as long as your feedback is negative, so you have to verify this, as long as you have negative feedback, and as long as your gain is large, these two modes will be the same. So in that calculation that we said earlier, say what is this current, then what you said was correct, and this is the reason. Because these two voltages are the same. Now whatever this one is, this is going to be very similar to that. However, it doesn't draw any current. It's a virtual ground, that's what it's called. Right? So it doesn't draw any current, or virtual short, more accurate. So this current is basically, so more accurately, if you want to calculate this, is the basic calculator, right? So we've all done this. We have mean in over R1. And the current is the same, so that's basically um, minus V out over R2, because this voltage is zero, this is ground, therefore V out over Vn is R2 minus R2 over R1. Right, just again on this thing. Now, that's all good and fine, and I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with this. But now, the other interesting thing is that what you see is actually, in that case, you see that the feedback is actually when you have a large gain, the gain of the closed loop system is the inverse of the feedback function, the amount of feedback you have, 1 over f, right, up there. And so is here, right, so you see the ratio of the resistive divider ratio. But now the question is, is this generally true? Now I make a claim that maybe it's interesting. Now what if, if I put a nonlinear function some V in V out relationship like V C in the feedback path. As long as I maintain a negative feedback situation, the function will be inverted too. So let me show you an example. Here's an example. So let's say I put a bipolar transistor in the feedback path. Let's see what's V and V out. Well, this current is again, if, first we have to check it, whether it's a negative feedback or not, right? So let's see, this goes up, this is a common base situation, this goes up, this is pushed down, this is an inverted. So it's a negative feedback situation, so that's good. So in that case, I have a virtual short, so this current, I see, is basically V in over R1, but I know I see is IS e to the VBE, which is what? Which is minus V out, right? Because base is in ground, and V out is here, so V out over VT. Now, if I solve this, so basically I can solve it for V out, V out would be minus VT, natural log of V in over R1 IS. So you see, by putting an exponential in the feedback path, I created a natural log. 
It's the inverse of a function. And you shouldn't be too surprised. So imagine that I put a box here. So for now, just imagine that I replace that with a box. Right? Let's call it that. So what, what the situation here is that, if I say this current i, this box says i is a function of fv out. Right? That's what i is. So I need characteristics, some functionality. In that case, I know i is v in over r, right? This is v in. V in is over v in over r, and then I have that which is equal to that function of v out. So v out in general is the inverse function of v in over r with some correction, uh, of course, to get the right units. You have to have some alpha here to get the right units here. So you can actually invert any function, any nonlinear function, by placing it in the feedback path. Actually, you will see that this concept of inverting things when you put them in the feedback path happens even, even in frequency domain. So the frequency response of what you put in the feedback path is actually effectively inverted. We'll see that next time. Well, next quarter. Um, so if you actually put zero in the feedback path, it will create a pole for you, vice versa, things like that. So, yeah, but this for instance is something of this sort. What is this? This is a log amplifier, right? So one of the things you could do with this is, if you have a log, what can you do? What are the things you can do? What does it, what is log good at? From a mathematical standpoint. Making the range smaller. Well, that's true. So if you, if you want to make some things look, appear to vary less, you have to put them on a log multiplier. Yeah, exactly. Converting multiplication and division into addition and subtraction. Right? So if I want to make a multiplier, for instance, can I use this to make a multiplier? Let's, let's make a multiplier. So I need, so let's say this, this is V1. Right? So to, to multiply two things, I have to create the logs of the two parameters and then add them. Right? That's how the slide rule works. Right? That's the basis for that. Everything is shown in, on a log scale. And therefore, when you want to multiply two things, you just add them in length and then basically multiply. Or you want to subtract. So you want to divide and subtract. So you want to make another one of these to get another log for the other function, for the other one. So let's say this is V2, the other voltage. And something like that. Right? So now I have to add these two voltages. How do I add two voltages? Well, one easy way is to convert them to currents. Right? And then drive the common, the, the virtual short node of an op amp like that. Right? Both of them inject current, so this is the sum of the two currents. So this one is simply uh, uh, VO1 over R1 plus VO2. Well, VO1 plus, since they are the same, it's VO1 plus VO2 over R1, the current. Just going through this guy, so this is basically minus VO1 plus VO2, which are given by these expressions. So what are they? So it's minus, the minus signs cancel, so it's VT, natural log of this with V1 plus that with V2. So which is natural log of V1 over R1IS plus natural log of V2 over R1IS, which is what? Which is Vt natural log of the product, V1, V2 over R1, Is squared. Okay? So now I have to, I have a log of the product. I want to convert it to the actual product. How do I do that? I need an exponential. Where do I get an exponential? You can do a similar thing. Well, I need a log somewhere, right? So you are, you are not proposing that I take one of these uh, and put it in a uh, feedback pattern. Because I already have it. Just use it. Just use it in Yeah, just drive the base. Right? Because when I put in this here, this current IC is IS E to that. If I make that my VBE, and that divide, the VT cancels too, so it becomes IS times. Um, V1, V2 over R1, um, sorry, R1 IS squared, and then I actually have to multiply by 
R, and that gives me the product some, some, and some other things. So I got the product. And you can do all sorts of things. You can subtract them, you can make a division. You can... So this is a simple thing, but it's based on the fact that I can generate, invert a, a function. And you can imagine another function being murder too. Okay. So let me stop here. Any questions on any of this? You have something else? Yes. Yeah, if you know, you really use this circuit to do the calculation. Multiplication? Yeah. Uh, you can use it, it has limited dynamic range. Mm -hmm. This is not the best way of making multiplier. There are other ways of making multipliers that have larger dynamic range. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, you could use this. For instance, you did another kind of multiplier before in one of your homework problems, right? In those translinear circuits. That's basically what we were doing. I mean, we were using the log. And <coughs> using those, you can make multipliers. You can, there's another way of making multipliers, which is basically using a, modulating the current of one device with the other one. So you modulate the GM of one. Because GM is proportional to IC, the bipolar, right? So if you change the IC with another transistor, modulate that, you can actually change the gain that you're multiplying two things. That's how mixers usually. Really get the, the correct answer. Within the reason, yeah, within the correct range of voltages, yes, you do. But you have to be within the correct range of voltage. Now, dynamic range is not very large, but yeah, it does work. 